And Malcolm was lured to Mexico because he wanted to help the disenfranchised African Mexican construction workers. That was one of Malcolm X's daughters talking about how the icon's grandson met his untimely demise in the process of helping people. But what makes his story even more compelling is that while most people knew the bad side of his story, there was so much more to him. I think the world lost a great soldier and a great leader. There's a lot of potential in that young brother. I've seen a lot of it coming out of him. Him, like his father, had to go through the fires of hell to step out to find himself. It would appear that, as the only male descendant of Malcolm X, the man might have had a target on his back since he was born. Troubled childhood. Uh, really, since the day he was born, I believe that he was seen uh, and treated by the system as, as a threat being the first male heir of, uh, you know, obviously a, a huge... You know. And speaking of targets, it turns out the story about his grandfather's passing may have been a total lie, as the case just got reignited. ...is suing the federal agencies and the NYPD for both the concealment uh, and the uh, kind of obstruction, as they put it, of justice to figure out who, in fact... Coming from the lineage of someone who was the poster for reform in America, among other things, the lives of some of the people in Malcolm X's family tree have been far from comfortable. Some may believe coming from a family of activists, a burden to lead people is usually thrust on the youngest generations of such families. And to some extent, that seems to be true for Malcolm X's grandchildren. Well, leadership abilities don't seem to be the only thing his grandchildren have in common with him. It seems that having the Malcolm name also put a target on their back, just like X himself had faced. You'd expect that even though their grandfather is a monumental figure that played a major role in America, being what it is today, they would at the very least have much easier lives than he did, but this couldn't be further from the truth. Although he was and even still is a prominent figure of activism, it is expected that most people may not know about Malcolm X's family. Outside of his six daughters, most of whom have been holding the banner of his life's work just as highly as he did when he was alive, several of the other people in that family tree have stayed out of the media. As for the ones that were making the headlines, the news coming out about them couldn't be any sadder because it was always from one major problem to the next. Now, in recent times, there have been a lot of conversations about how Malcolm X's case may have been intentionally swept under the rug, a theory that seems to be supported by members of his family also falling into the same kind of situation. If I didn't know any better, I'd think these people were intentionally fixated upon because they come from a family of activists. However, the activist's grandson, in particular, lived a life that was almost the opposite of what X stood for, so you can understand why there hasn't been much talk about the third generation. The tragic details of these young people in the Malcolm X family line have come as a shock to a lot of people on social media. To many, if you come from a family of activists that helped shape your country, you should probably get some sort of privilege while also living your life in a similar pattern. However, these fans are now learning the cold nature of reality. And one week before my father's assassination, our family home was targeted. A firebomb was thrown into the nursery where my sisters and I slept as babies. When Malcolm X was shot in the Audubon Ballroom in New York, three of his daughters watched it happen, even as their pregnant mother covered them with her body. The trauma would permeate the family's life, leading some of its members down some dark paths, starting with the person that was most expected to be like him, saying the life of Malcolm Shabazz, the grandson and namesake of the African-American civil rights leader Malcolm X, was troubled would be an understatement. Like his grandfather, Malcolm Shabazz went from a destabilized home to street life and later to activism, only to have that work cut short by a death shrouded in mystery, confusion, and too much inattention. Shabazz was the first male descendant of Malcolm X, the fiery civil rights figure and member of the Nation of Islam, who was slain after giving a speech in New York City in 1965. Malcolm's widow, Betty Shabazz, raised her six daughters alone while keeping the memory of her husband alive. Her second daughter, Kubila, was Malcolm Shabazz's mother. In some ways, the life of the young Shabazz paralleled that of his grandfather, with frequent moves and family disruptions in his childhood, outbursts of violence, and time in prison. According to a 1997 article in the Washington Post, by the time he was five, Malcolm Shabazz would address bus drivers and male teachers as dad. 
Shabazz first appeared in an unwanted spotlight in June 1997 when he was 12. While living with his grandmother in Yonkers, New York, he set fire to her apartment. Betty Shabazz was left with third-degree burns over 80% of her body. Rescuers said she repeatedly said, my grandson, as if to indicate that he was still inside the burning apartment. But Malcolm Shabazz was soon taken into custody while wandering the streets, his clothes soaked with gasoline. After three weeks, Betty Shabazz died from her injuries at age 61. The young Shabazz pleaded guilty to juvenile charges of arson and second-degree manslaughter and spent 18 months in juvenile detention centers. In a 2003 interview, he said he thought his grandmother could find her way to safety and escape the fire. He also said he had imaginary conversations with the woman he called Mama Betty. I just wanted her to know I was sorry and I wanted to know she accepted my apology, that I didn't mean it, he said, but I would get no response and I really wanted that response. Paralleled his grandfathers in many ways, um, particularly being you know, criminalized at a young age and then being incarcerated for a, a good majority of his life. Even as a teenager, Shabazz later said, he was a member of the Blood Street Gang and at 18, he went to prison for three years for robbery. He studied Islam in prison and said other inmates were well aware of his legacy. My name will bring attention, he said in 2003. People know Malcolm Shabazz, whether you like me or not. Tragically, Malcolm Shabazz was found beaten to death on a street in Mexico City a decade later on May 9, 2013. He was reportedly in the country to help Mexican construction workers who were being discriminated against in the United States. It was later determined that Shabazz's death was related to an argument over a $1,200 bar tab and his refusal to pay for drinks with females who worked at a nightclub called The Palace as a part of a tourist scam. Malcolm Latif Shabazz was born on October 8, 1984 in Paris, where his mother Kubala was studying at the time. Kubala Shabazz was four when she witnessed her father. She dropped out of Princeton University and moved to Paris, where she met an Algerian man who was Malcolm Shabazz's father, but had no further contact with the family. In 1995, Kubila Shabazz was indicted for trying to hire a hitman to K. Louis Farrakhan, the Nation of Islam leader she believed may have had a role in her father's death. Her son was taken from her custody and lived with aunts and other relatives, but had few father figures in his life. Kubila and her son were not the only descendants of Malcolm X who were troubled. Her sister, Malika, also faced just as many challenges. Some would even say more than Kubila. Back in 2017, news reported that the daughter and granddaughter of slain black nationalist Malcolm X were charged with stealing a rental truck that was found in Southern Maryland carrying animals in what police described as terrible conditions. Malika, Sabin Shabazz of Berlin, New Hampshire, and her daughter Betty Bahia. Shabazz of Stark, New Hampshire, were released in Charles County after posting bond of $2,000 each, according to online court records. The women were arrested in a Walmart parking lot in La Plata by an officer responding to a report that the U-Haul truck in which they were traveling had been reported stolen earlier that day to Vermont State Police, said Janelle Love, spokeswoman for the Charles County Sheriff's Office. Upon further examination of the truck, it was discovered that the pair were transporting pit bulls stacked in crates in what was described as inhumane conditions. In total, seven animals were recovered, and some of the dogs had severe injuries. Malika Shabazz was charged with seven counts of animal cruelty, as well as theft, and Betty Shabazz was charged with only theft. It is worth mentioning that six years before this arrest, Malika pleaded guilty in 2011 to stealing the identity of a 70-year-old woman to obtain credit cards and make purchases totaling $55,000. Malika is one of six children of Malcolm X, born Malcolm Little and Betty Shabazz. But unlike her sisters that got to meet their father, Malika was born seven months after her father was assassinated in February 1965 in New York City by three members of the Nation of Islam, which Malcolm X had left a year earlier. Speaking of the icon's assassination, there has been a lot of talk on the subject in recent times about how the real story may have been far more complicated than what was reported at the time. This was made clear as new evidence on the case has come up. The new details now paint an entirely different picture from what investigators previously reported, and it's on the verge of becoming another full-blown case.
Hurt. Malcolm X's family members, along with attorney Ben Crump, are announcing two new witnesses that are offering evidence in the alleged conspiracy case surrounding his assassination. Her new reports in a dramatic turn of events that could potentially rewrite a pivotal chapter of American history. Attorney Ben Crump, flanked by the descendants of Malcolm X, unveiled new evidence in the decades-old assassination case of the iconic civil rights leader. During a press conference that felt as much a summoning of history as it was a legal briefing, Crump introduced two elderly witnesses whose testimonies could lead to groundbreaking legal actions. This moment, ripe with the promise of justice long deferred, signals a new chapter in the quest to unravel the truth behind one of the most enigmatic figures of the civil rights movement. The press conference, detailed on Ben Crump's official website, marked the introduction of two individuals who served as security associates of Malcolm X. These witnesses, stepping into the public eye for the first time, shared their accounts, shedding light on the alleged involvement of federal and New York government agencies in the assassination. Federal government does even more to try to keep the truth from coming to you all and coming to the family. In Crump's words, every time we present new information to corroborate our conspiracy claims, it seems, Attorney Taylor, that the federal government does even more to try to keep the truth from coming to you all and coming to the family. As you know, the federal government continues to conceal even to this day information that we have requested from them months ago. The gravity of their testimonies cannot be overstated, as they offer a potential breakthrough in a case that has been shrouded in mystery and speculation for nearly six decades. But Crump has maintained that the authorities seem to be firmly against this. During his speech at the conference, he said, they keep coming up with excuses. For some of our four-year requests, the federal government has refused to even acknowledge the documents, much less tell us that they are looking for them. They even said to us, we can't give you this information because Malcolm X is still potentially living. I mean, we have that in a letter from the federal authorities. Seems a little shady, right? Anyway, the unveiling of this new evidence by Crump and the presence of Malcolm X's family at the press conference served as a poignant reminder of the ongoing struggle for truth and justice. It underscores the significance of Malcolm X's legacy and the enduring impact of his assassination on the fight for civil rights and social justice in America. They even told us we could not receive documents on Malcolm X because he was still potentially living. Can you? The implications of the new evidence and testimonies introduced by Crump are profound, with the potential to lead to significant legal and societal ramifications. While the specifics of the evidence remain under wraps, its mere existence reignites hope for accountability and closure for Malcolm X's family and supporters. This development not only reopens a pivotal case in American history, but also raises critical questions about the role of government agencies in the civil rights era. It challenges us to confront uncomfortable truths about the lengths to which institutions may go to suppress dissenting voices. Well, several people on the internet already seem to be past questioning as they are already making assertions. One person wrote, this is not new. Netflix documentary Who K Malcolm X covered everything. The government just couldn't cover up everything anymore. Others also believe this to be the underlying trauma responsible for how some of his descendants turned out. So, with everything that was revealed in the conference about the government seemingly preventing them from getting access to the information they need, is it really far-fetched that they might have played a role in the activists' demise? Tell us. That's it. Goodbye.